I'm a social game designer and a bass player, and I love collaborating with other people. Today, I'm going to tell you about three trends that are dramatically reshaping the gaming industry and ushering in a new era of connected, collaborative gaming. But first, before I share with you what's just over the horizon, I have a confession to make. I've never actually said this in public. I'm a game designer. I make my living designing scoring systems. And I hate keeping score. It all started back when I was a kid. I was loved music, and I studied classical piano, as many kids do, and performed in rank order competitions. I actually did pretty well. I hated it. It almost destroyed my love of music. I wanted to play with people. I didn't want to compete against them. So I took up guitar. I learned a bunch of popular songs. And then, one evening, on a remote beach in Greece while I was backpacking through Europe, I had a conversion experience. After trying unsuccessfully to talk to the other backpackers, none of whom spoke English, I pulled out my guitar around our evening campfire and I led everyone in a rousing sing-along of Beatles songs. All you need is love and a six-string guitar. And then, instantly, connection and collaboration. Playing in bands taught me what it means to collaborate with a small group of synergistic people and work on something greater than you yourself could do. Working in the games industry, designing social games and collaborative software taught me about how humans behave online. Now, one thing I ran into when I started in the games industry is that by definition, most of the people I was working with assumed that a game is something where you're dealing with opponents, conflict, and combat. I've even taught that very concept here at USC when I teach game design. But that wasn't jiving with my interests or what I was experiencing on the job. One of my first gaming jobs was working on Ultima Online. How many of you remember Ultima Online? Yeah. And what I was working on was collaborative systems, group dynamics, and social interaction. And I saw how powerful that could be. This point was really driven home when I worked on The Sims, one of the most popular gaming franchises of all time. This game doesn't have a win or lose state. There's no notion of opponents. However, it was a breakthrough hit, and it was one of the very first PC games to reach a mass female audience. Later, I had the wonderful opportunity to work on Rock Band and bring my years of playing in bands and learning to collaborate in those kinds of groups into computer software. Again, we were designing basically a collaborative gaming experience, going against the grain. Much to the amazement of myself and everyone on that team, that game was also a big hit. Meanwhile, I was also applying my gaming chops to social software, designing the Power Sellers program and other systems for eBay, and also working on onboarding mechanics for Netflix. So I tried to figure out, what is a game? How does this jive with what I learned when I first started in the games industry? So I came up with my own definition. To me, a game is a structured experience that has rules and goals. That's fun, a much broader definition. So while I was trying to reconcile the, my new understanding with the competition-focused world of gaming that I found myself in, I found some very useful insights from game theory, which I'm going to share with you now. Let's start with defining a zero-sum game. That is a game where we are opponents. There's a winner and a loser. Our interests are divergent. They are not aligned. So boxing. Chess and other war strategy simulations. Any rank order competition, including the Olympics and those childhood piano recitals I told you about, these are all zero-sum games. Now, a non-zero-sum game is a game where we are partners, not opponents. We win together and we lose together. Our interests are aligned. So, double dutch, 
Pictionary, a charity walk. All of these are examples of non-zero-sum collaborative gaming. So a good shorthand way to remember this is to ask yourself in any structured situation that could be a game, when I'm looking at the other people here, are they my partners or are they my opponents? That's the essential difference. And that helped me understand these different kinds of games I was experiencing. So now we're ready to talk about these three disruptive trends and understand the implications. The first is the rise of ubiquitous connected devices. People used to play games on consoles and on dedicated gaming devices. But now, with the rise of net-connected computers, smartphones, and tablets, that's no longer true. Here's a chart showing the overall gaming market revenues. As you can see, the overall market is growing and is continuing to grow. But look at that bottom dark blue area. That's console gaming. Since 2008, it's been flat, and in some years, it even declined. All the growth in the market is coming from mobile, social, and online PC gaming. If you just look at mobile gaming, you can see a very dramatic shift between 2009 and 2011. 2009, Nintendo DS dominated the market for mobile gaming. Two short years later, iOS and Android phones are what's dominant, and that trend is accelerating. Will Wright, who created The Sims, calls this the Gamerian explosion, which means that there are a lot of different kinds of games, new forms, new life forms, if you were, that are enabled by this trend. And again, that's accelerating and continuing. The second trend we're seeing that's disrupting the gaming industry is that gaming is now a mainstream, all-ages activity, no longer a place just for 14-year-old boys. A recent study by M2 Research found that 93% of kids report that they play games online. And it's not just boys who are playing. Games like Just Dance, which has been a smash hit at the top of the charts through, all, through many incarnations, are showing us that girls, if you give them games that are enjoyable, girls really enjoy playing games too. Older people are getting online as well. Did you know that the fastest growing demographic on Facebook is people over 55, and that women are the ones who are, who are signing up the most? They're ready and willing to play games. They just have to get some games they enjoy. <laughs> games like Brain Age on the Nintendo DS, originally released in 2007, now on every platform imaginable, showed older people that games weren't just a trivial pursuit, they can actually help you keep your brain sharp. The third trend is what I call mutual entertainment, which is people entertaining each other with their own content. You can understand this if you look at the number of hours spent online. Now, gaming is a big source of hours spent online. People love to game. But the hours gaming are dwarfed by the hours spent social networking and blogging, logging onto sites like Facebook and YouTube. An interesting part of this trend is Instagram. A two-year-old company recently purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars. Very simple app. What you can do with Instagram is snap a photo of your everyday life, put a filter on it to make it pretty, and then share it with anyone who cares to follow you. Very simple, very addictive. Instagram isn't a game, but Instagram has the game-like addictive quality that Facebook and Twitter have. You never know what's going to show up next in your stream, so you keep checking. And the likes and the comments that people leave are both compelling and unpredictable. Another interesting example is Draw Something, which is mobile Pictionary. What you do is you're given a word by the game, you draw a little picture using your smartphone or your tablet, and your partner in the game has to guess what you drew. If they guess correctly, you both get a reward, shown here as coins. If they don't guess correctly, neither of you gets a reward. That's the veritable definition of a non-zero-sum game mechanic. 
It's also a great example of mutual entertainment, people entertaining each other with their own content. Now, we know from studies up from the science of happiness that building meaningful social connections is one of the most reliable ways that we can make ourselves happier. A lot of this can go on in gaming. Think about playing hopscotch. How many of you played hopscotch when you were a kid? I know I did. Do you remember who won or what the score was? No, that's not what hopscotch is about. What we remember is what it felt like to play, the feel of those objects in your hands, and who you played with, and how that enhanced your social relationships. We also know from studying the science of happiness that social comparison is one of the most reliable ways to make yourself unhappier, especially if you're comparing yourself to someone who's got something bigger than yours. <laughs> so think about that the next time that somebody says, hey, let's slap a leaderboard on that website. That'll make it more like a game. It'll make it fun. If you're ever in that situation, ask yourself, what emotions are you trying to go for here? What kind of game do you want to create? Are you going for zero-sum emotions, which are dominance, envy, that kind of feeling? If so, then sure, leaderboard will do great. But if you're trying to go for non-zero-sum emotions, reciprocity, mutual support, gladness in somebody else's doing well, then that's not going to get you there. Recently, my friend, the Reverend Sandy Richards, here today, taught me a new word, Ubuntu. It's an African word that means I am because we are. An anthropologist went to Africa and he showed a bunch of kids a basket of fruit, put it a few yards away. He said, go get it. First one wins. They joined hands, they ran to the basket, shared it together. He said, why didn't one of you go get it for yourself? They looked up at him puzzled and they said, Ubuntu. Collaboration and collaborative gaming is not just a trend that's happening in the industry, it's a key 21st century skill. Games can profoundly influence who we are and how we think about the world. I want my kids to grow up in a world where their games will help teach them to look at people as partners, not just as opponents. The good news, it's great news actually, is that collaborative gaming is on the rise. If you want to ride this wave with me, then stop focusing your games and your gamified systems on keeping score, gaining status, and pummeling your opponents. Instead, try thinking about how you can enable meaningful interactions and how you can inc incorporate non-zero-sum game mechanics and see where that takes you. The time is now, and you are just the people to do it. Thank you.